Our topic uh, today uh, for illumination is the Ten Commandments. Um, in our inclusive church service uh, this morning, we were talking about the Sabbath, and the Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Um, for me, the Ten Commandments is always this particular movie. <laughs> Whenever I think of the Ten Commandments, this is one of the movies that um, I've seen. I, there's a handful of movies like Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, that I've seen a hundred times or more. <laughs> and one of those movies is um, uh, the Ten Commandments because we, uh, I was alive as a little kid when we got our first um, video tape recorder in 1978. <laughs> And it, the tapes were not wild, widely available, so we and they and we only had they were also expensive. We only had like ten cassettes, and so we, you know, we which we recorded from the we recorded from the television. And so we one of the ones that we had was we had Fiddler on the Roof, we had <laughs> the Ten Commandments, uh, we had What's Up Doc. Anyway, a couple other movies. Anyway, so I, this one I know very well. <laughs> so. Anyway, there's another movie that had the that had the same scene in it. It was called The History of the World, <laughs> and uh, it starts out: How many tablets did he bring down? <laughs> you know, how many commandments did he bring down? And he brought these 15, no, 10. So 10 commandments. Well, I thought he had 50, but he tripped and fell. That's right. So he, <laughs> he tripped and fell, and there's a, he's just got 10. <laughs> That's we'll just stick with that. <laughs> All right. So what mountain was Moses on? Sinai. Any other chess guesses? No. No. It wasn't Sinai. So let me read. And Moses had been shepherding the flock of Jethro, his father in law, a priest of Midian, and he drove the flock at the far side of the wilderness, and he came to the mountain of God to Horeb. Mount Horeb. Hmm. So that's Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. But here, in Exodus 19, 18, we read, and Mount Sinai was all smoke because Yahweh came down on it in fire and its smoke went up like the smoke of a great furnace and the whole mountain trembled greatly. So which was the name? Um, it sounds like it, but, the, the, but the, the traditional mountain that we have, so the question is, was it volcanic? Um, the, uh, <coughs> The traditional place that we now have identified, you know, as like this, in other words, in, in Sinai as Mount Sinai slash Mount Horeb, which is now identified as if it was the same mountain, and uh, there's one kind of traditional place where this very famous Orthodox monastery, uh, St. Catherine's is, uh, that uh, that's not a volcano. <laughs> but nevertheless, it sort of sounds like one is in the, in the thing here, and actually what we, what we can say about the traditional location, that traditional sighting, we don't know that that's the mountain that's meant, and we also don't know, frankly, whether the authors who are writing Mount Sinai and the other author who's writing Mount Horeb are even referring to the same mountain. They're using these words differently. So we've seen before, for example, um, you know, for that you know, when he's like tending sheep for his uh, father-in-law, um, that his father-in-law's name is Jethro, and he's certainly called Jethro, Sheik of Midian in the movie The Ten Commandments, right? So Moses had been shepherding the flock of Jethro, and that's when he goes to Mount Horeb. But we also have here, uh, and the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came near and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, and Moses got up and saved them and watered their flock. And they came to Raoul, their father. So in this text that we have from the Bible, his father-in-law's name is Raoul, as opposed to um, uh, as opposed to Jethro. And Moses was content to live with the man, and he gave Zipporah, uh, his daughter, to Moses, and she gave uh, birth to a son, and he called his name Gershom. And so um, one of the things that we've seen kind of again and again in this class as we are looking at Torah, as we're looking at the Pentateuch, the first five books attributed to Moses, is that there are different authorial voices there's different narrative voices that are embedded inside the text, and they actually have different um, stories. So some of them are preserving that Moses' father-in-law is, is this guy named Jethro, and another of them are preserving that there, it's uh, a guy named Raul. Uh, and so the um, way that traditionally people 
um, who are both Jewish and Christian have uh, reconciled that is to simply say, okay, Raul is Jethro. Um, and that's just how, uh, you know, so he has two different names. And that's just how uh, we've traditionally reconciled that. But um, more likely, actually, the case is that these are two separate stories that have been interlaced together. And these are two separate different understandings of who Moses' father-in-law is, of different names. And now they've been combined together by us in our minds in a synthesis when we read the two stories and we make a movie about it. <laughs> so some part of the story comes from the one, part of the story comes from the other. Okay, so we asked, so what are the Ten Commandments? And we played this game in our, our class this morning, and we did very, very well indeed. We got nine out of ten commandments. <laughs> the only one that we had forgotten was honor thy father and thy mother. And so once you start getting down the list of thou shalt nots, don't covet, don't, <laughs> and everything like that, you start thinking, well, they're all the shalt nots. But there are some positive ones too, like um, honor thy father and thy mother. So there's this guy, Len Westmoreland, who is a U.S. congressman, or was a U.S. congressman from Georgia, and he was sponsoring a bill that required that the Ten Commandments be prominently displayed in the U.S. Capitol building. And so um, you may be aware of the controversy that they have in the United States about um, church and state. And so there is, uh, the system works a little differently in U.S. constitutional system than it does, for example, in Canada and the other British um, uh, Westminster uh, style governments. Um, but essentially the First Amendment uh, in the United States Constitution uh, guarantees freedom of religion. And so if you um, have the government constantly imposing one religion, then that is in fact um, not, is, is ending freedom of religion because it is mean that everybody else doesn't have free exercise of their religion or their right in, indeed to not have exercising a religion at all. Nevertheless, there's a bunch of guys like um, Lynn Westmoreland, who would like to impose a religion and end freedom of religion despite the U.S. Constitution. So um, during an interview with Stephen Colbert, uh, Colbert asked Westmoreland to list the Ten Commandments, and so he tries to list them off himself. Don't murder, don't lie, don't steal. Um, <laughs> I guess I can't admit them all. <laughs> admit them all. <laughs> you got three. Um, you know, so this is, I think, a funny thing, which is to say, on the one hand, you want to have these posted because they're so incredibly important and you've committed to memory three. <laughs> anyway, so. All right. So here is a list of the Ten Commandments from Exodus 34, 4a, 6a, and 14 through 16. So Moses got up early in the morning and went uh, up to Mount Sinai as Yahweh commanded him, and he took in his hands two tablets of stones, and Yahweh passed in front of him and called. So you can see right here, this is about the tablets, right? So this is the moment, he's on Sinai, and, and we're having the tablets go. It says, one, for you shall not bow to another god, because Yahweh, his name is jealous, he is a jealous god. Two, you shall not make molten gods for yourself. Three, you shall observe the festival of unleavened bread. Four, the first birth of every womb is mine. Five, six days you shall work, and in the seventh day you shall cease. Six, you shall make a festival of weeks, of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the festival of gathering. Seven, you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice on unleavened bread. Eight, the sacrifice of the festival of Passover shall not remain until the morning. Nine, you shall bring the first fruits of your land to the house of Yahweh your God. And 10, you shall not cook a kid in its mother's milk. So these are just as you memorize them as a little kid, right? These are the 10 commandments that we all know and, and have heard, right? <laughs> So it should be very unfamiliar to us. But this is also starting to, um, I think, fit a pattern for us as we, when we are looking at the biblical texts, we realize that, again, there are these places where um, the story is repeated multiple times. They're what we call doublets, and in fact, even triplets. And it turns out that the Ten Commandments appears three times in the Pentateuch. Uh, the listing, the story of the ten, going and getting the Ten Commandments and even listing off what the Ten Commandments are. Um, and this, which is possibly the oldest um, of the stories, lists a very different set of what the Ten Commandments are uh, than the other two. And so why, why would that be? Again, what we have inside this, this is an, an evidence that we have 
that the uh, Bible as we have it is, has multiple different authors who understand um, their, their religion, ancient Israelite religion differently, who as they go back and are trying to um, tell this story, um, they are even themselves remembering the list of commandments quite differently uh, than the other authors. Um, on this one, there's only a couple of them that are, let's say, in the traditional 10 that we pull from the other parts of the Bible, right? So uh, God is jealous, don't make idols, and, um, and uh, honor the Sabbath day, right? So those are the ones that, um, that make it into the other list. But this is another set of 10 commandments uh, that exists in the Bible. So we've talked about this several times and we all know and get bored of my chart that I love. <laughs> but essentially that earliest list of 10 commandments that we have uh, that I just read is actually from this J source, the Yahwist source. This is that source that we talked about in the last several lectures that is the courtly source that I was suggesting it could have even been written by uh, a Judahite princess, so it might be the female author or whatever, but in any event, it's somebody associated with the court in Jerusalem. We also have the Eloist source that reflects the traditions of the northern kingdom, the kingdom of the ten tribes of the northern Israel, that those came together by an, an R, a redactor, an editor who put them together and made a text composite. But then we have that priestly author who wrote all of the, uh, the different um, long rituals and things like that. And we have the Deuteronomist who wrote the book of Deuteronomy and edited it and created the Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy that we have. And that those were all brought together then by a final redactor or editor until we have the Pentateuch or the five books attributed to Moses as it exists in um, our current Bible, right? And so that's one of that 10 commandments that I just read is from the J author. And so it's one of the lists. So in fact, actually, we have, I mentioned, uh, in the Pentateuch as we have it, three separate lists of the Ten Commandments. One from the J author, and that's recorded in Exodus 34. One from the Eloist author, the E source, that's in Exodus 20. And one from the Deuter Deuteronomist. And so this is the one, that, the Eloist one, is the one that we all tend to remember. <laughs> Uh, as the Ten Commandments. But the other ones, like J, we already read through what all the J ones are, so I'll look at it here just quickly. Um, the E at the Eloist and the, and the Deuteronomist uh, lists are almost exactly the same. There's just one variation that I'll point out. So this one is, have no other gods before my face, do not make statues of any form, do not bring the name of Yahweh for a falsehood, remember the Sabbath day to make it holy, and the difference here between the two then, the one only difference is not that the commandment is different, but why you're doing it is different. So traditionally, and what we talked about today in church, it's in honor of God's creation of the world in six days. So in other words, God rested on the seventh day, uh, and that's why we have a Sabbath day. But in the Deuteronomist it says, in honor of God freeing you from slavery in Egypt. And so it's possible um, it's that the Deuteronomist uh, is either earlier or, or something that they are not maybe even aware of um, the tradition of a creation of the world in seven days story. And so instead, they're uh, hearkening to this story of freeing uh, the slaves from Egypt. Um, the E uh, and D lists continue. Honor your father and your mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not testify against your neighbor as a lying witness. Do not covet your neighbor's house or anything your neighbor has. And so um, and there are leng lengthier explanations, but that's kind of a summary of each one. All right. So I was listening to um, a kind of a favorite radio program uh, this weekend as I was doing the dishes and things like that, which I tend to do. And Ira Glass, who is the host of a radio program called This American Life, had um, gone to a conference where he was talking to uh, a friend of his who's a uh, Methodist minister uh, about um, this idea of, um, you know, anyway, what, what's, the, what's the idea of, uh, of, your, of being religious? Since Ira, you know, grew up Jewish and uh, learned all of the Hebrew prayers by heart, but now has become an atheist and is not, um, he doesn't find any value in any of these kind of things necessarily. And um, 
his friend had kind of said, well, look, for me, it comes down to, you know, these kind of these great, two great commandments that are in the gospel, love God and love thy neighbor as thyself. And he goes through and talks about essentially the values and the motivation behind it and how, um, you know, why that inspires him to be a Methodist uh, minister. And Ira was kind of like responding, well, look, I totally get this whole love your neighbor <laughs> as yourself. I think that this is a, a, a wonderful um, uh, thing for everybody to be committed to doing. Wouldn't, it be, wouldn't the world be a better place if we were all honoring that and trying to uh, love all of our neighbors and, and make society better that way? But then Ira was like, but what's this thing about why is love God important? <laughs> So if God, if there is a God who is the creator of all of the universe, and what, why on earth does this guy want you to sit around and praise him all day long? In other words, what is this? What is the point? And and so Ira was saying, for example, he his his mother has passed away uh, many years ago, and one of the things that you do um, as a, an observant Jew uh, on the day on the anniversary of of a loved one, a near loved one's death, you go and you read a special prayer in synagogue Kaddish uh, for on their behalf. And as you and he knows all of the the prayer, it's a uh, by you know memory from his childhood in Hebrew. Uh, and he went and said it with all of his family members on on that particular day. Uh, and he was struck by how he goes to the synagogue. He said it's on how, in a way, um, you know, because he's a radio host and he makes new shows every week or whatever he says, how every time you go to a synagogue, every day it's a rerun <laughs> or a repeat, you know, because essentially they say the same prayers again and again and again. And the prayers of the Kaddish are essentially praise God, praise the Lord and all this kind of thing. So it's like the Psalms and the hymns and this kind of thing. And so he's like, again, why, you know, if, if God is like a heavenly parent, um, if our parents um, were to have insisted on us at all times that what, you know, that you're just... To praise us as, as, as your parent, wouldn't that be a, a mentally deranged parent, you know, or something like that? And so it's been a, it's been a question that, um, that he had. And so he's, fortunately, his minister explained it to him a little bit better. Um, you know, and so part of the issue, I think, that um, Ira wasn't, hasn't been getting and that a lot of um, people who maybe are identifying themselves as non-believers um, uh, don't always get is to, is just even un understanding what that even means as a as a as a self identification, right? So, you know, um, one of the things that Ira was saying was, okay, so he's saying that prayer, and he's saying that prayer though as a non-believer, and that the thing that was amazing to him, you know, was that one, it worked, <laughs> you know, which is to say that he felt so much better. And he, uh, you know, as he was, um, you know, in, in, in honoring his mother's memory in this particular way, and it also caused him to reflect how, you know, his parents and all his ancestors all the way going back, you know, have been observant Jews for thousands of years. You know how they have said essentially the same prayer uh, in a language that, for over two thousand years, none of them have spoken as their as their native language, and yet it's repeated in that same. Uh, that same way, and how there's this amazing chain of that that has led to him, um, in, and what he didn't really reflect on, I think, is that, but it also ends with him because of him not, um, not continuing on with that, right? But anyway, so he is part of that uh, amazing chain that has led there. So uh, one of the things, you know, anyway, the difference between him and all of those people that went before, believers and not the non-believer, um, is that by identifying even as an unbeliever, you're even ha making, a, that's a negative identity, right? You're not saying what you are, you're saying what you aren't. So you're defining yourself in opposition to, let's say, everyone who went before you. Um, so what is a believer? Because we have to, if we have to identify that. And so I think one of the th stereotypes or one of the um, logical reductions that everybody is facing that I think is very confusing to Ira and actually to a whole bunch of other people who are struggling with this question of um, whether there's anything important to believe in or what, it, what does believing in mean is that believers and non-believers in the 21st century have a similar um, thing in mind, one idea, um, and that is a particular impression of what, uh, of God, let's say, and a particular picture. So essentially, this is uh, God talking to Homer Simpson, but essentially this is a caricature of um, a God, right? 
um, which is, this, this is now one that's more, <laughs> uh, less blasphemous than The Simpsons, but it's, you know, since it's on the ceiling in the Vatican, <laughs> but by Michelangelo, but the same like, kind of idea, right? So a guy uh, with white hair, a white beard, a white guy, a white robe, <laughs> Uh, in other words, picturing God very um, literally and very specifically in a particular way. And so Ira, on the one hand, um, doesn't believe that this guy you know, with uh, the white hair and the white robe and everything like that exists. And he specifically is believing that all of the people who are around him, like his Methodist minister friend, is believing in a very literalistic, uh, uh, let's say, God as a human guy, just like who could appear as a character in The Simpsons kind of way. Um, so if we're gonna unpack that, um, that kind of uh, caricature view, we kind of have to look then, uh, if we go back now to the Ten Commandments, how did the ancient Israelites, and then later if we go to the Christian New Testament time, how did the Christians at the time of the early apostles, um, and then later, how did Christians and Jews throughout uh, the late antiquity and the Middle Ages, how did they picture God? So we've seen how in the Renaissance, Michelangelo is, uh, is picturing God. So how did people in antiquity picture God? And I'm gonna suggest to the, you the answer is that they didn't picture God. <laughs> um, it's very specific in the Ten Commandments that you're not supposed to picture God, right? In fact, uh, not only, for example, uh, so the ancient Israelites are not to um, uh, make any idols. They also don't, at a certain point, paint any pictures or any kind of depictions of God. And indeed, as uh, Judaism evolves that, that, um, into rabbinic Judaism, that stricture becomes so strong that they don't say the, the name of God. So we have the four letters, and I've been saying it because I'm not Jewish, and so as Christians we do tend to say it, and the, tradition, the traditional way that the Christians say that name is Jehovah, but we know that a, a better translation is probably Yahweh. And so I've been saying Yahweh in this class, um, but uh, I'm just saying that even saying the name is, a, is blasphemy in now in rabbinic Judaism. So instead they say Adonai, they say Lord, when, when they come to that place in the text. So images of God are forbidden by the Hebrew Bible. Uh, the Jerusalem temple lacked a cult statue. So what does that mean? So the, the temple in Jerusalem that we think of that Solomon built originally and that later the Herod, Herod rebuilt, so the um, Herod's temple or Solomon's temple, that is very similar in all its layout for any other Middle Eastern temple or indeed if you think of like what a Greek temple is like. So if you think of the Parthenon, uh, it's not a building where everybody goes inside it to worship. You're not even allowed to go in there. Um, and indeed, it's only generally speaking the, the priests and priestesses in the case of uh, the pagan temples uh, of, a, who, of, a, of the precinct that are able to go in and be with what is the God's house and what in almost all of the other ones would be a house that has a, a cult statue, an idol, um, that represents the God and indeed is thought to have, let's say, a spark of the divinity inhabiting that statue. Um, so you can't, uh, that's what's in all the rest of them. The, the temple in Jerusalem is just like this, but it doesn't have that in there. So it's empty in there. There's the Ark of the Covenant in the, in the original one. They don't have that anymore. There's other, other temple apparatus in there, like for example, the menorah. So in any event, there's no statue. Rabbinic Judaism doesn't picture it. The early Christians also followed that practice. Uh, and early Christians indeed, when, and the Eastern Christians, I mean, so in the Greek Orthodox Church and the Byzantine Church in the eighth century, they had a conflict that led to a massive civil war called the Iconoclasm. Uh, when uh, the Eastern Church decided, okay, it's wrong, it's blasphemy for us to have statues, and indeed it's blasphemy for us to have images or pictures uh, of of gods and things like that. And so they, they got rid of all of their icons, they destroyed all their mosaics, they smashed all of their, their statues and all those kind of things in civil wars. Um, ultimately, that they fought that out until they decided at the end, okay, well, we, we can't have statues, but we ha can have pictures. And so that's why you maybe are familiar in the Eastern tradition uh, with Byzantine icons, and they're so beautiful and everything like that, and that's a major part of their worship. That was sort of the solution, that they would have the pictures, but not statues. In the Western tradition, you may be aware, if you go to old you know, cathedrals, there's statues all over the place. It's no big deal. In the, the, in the Latin church, nobody got into this question, but it's, it's, in other words, it's an operating thing. Islam, of course, forbids images of any kind, right? So even if you have, um, you can't do on mosques and things like that, pictures of 
even animals and things like that, because that's uh, not, not allowed. So there's a, there is a long tradition of having these kinds of um, strictures against portraying God. So why would that be? Why do we want to do that? So I'm gonna suggest that there can be a problem, and so this is a picture from our own restoration tradition. This is a picture of a young man, Joseph Smith, as he is praying in the woods. Um, he recounts a vision, and in multiple different versions of the vision, by the end, the, the last version of the vision, he talks about um, having a vision of God who appears to him in two distinct personages, the Father and Jesus. And almost always when it's portrayed, we have that same idea of the, um, I don't know, the guy with the white beard, <laughs> he's wearing the white toga, uh, they do not have, you know, fashion doesn't get updated fast in heaven, right? They're still wearing the same thing the Romans were wearing. Uh, uh, white, white hair and white guy and everything like that. And I think what ended up happening in the course of uh, Joseph Smith's life, because he has had that picture in his head, uh, that picture that has evolved in modern times, um, uh, he ended up speculating theologically about a very literal, physical, finite, human-like God, a God that is of flesh and bones, a God that is once a human being who has become exalted and who has a separate being who is literally his son as Jesus. And so this is kind of a theological innovation that happened at the end of Joseph Smith's life that we um, have rejected as a church ourselves, um, but it's coming out of uh, what happens when you start to really hone in on a picture I think, of God, and you say, this is really what God is exactly like, and then you start to really come up with these kinds of notions when you do that. So within the Bible itself, um, there are very big tensions, uh, and we've read this again and again, where with, between the portrayals and the portraits of how God is portrayed. Um, as we've seen this, these different narrative voices, when we've talked about the Yahwist or J sources creation story and compared that to the priestly sources creation story, you may be very familiar with the priestly one. Uh, the world is created in six days and God rests on the, on the seventh day. Uh, that God is a cosmic God who is never pictured physically uh, in the priestly source. Instead, the spirit of God is moving across the waters of the deep. God is as saying, let there be light, and there's these cosmic results. The God of the Yahweh source walks uh, in the garden uh, with Adam and Eve uh, in creating Adam blew with mouth, his mouth into Adam's nostrils, life, uh, pulled a rib from Eve, shuts Noah's ark with hands. What? I'm sorry, ripped from Adam to make Eve, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so there's a tension then uh, that is also played out in the narrative between uh, kind of a, a more finite, uh, fleshy God who is the national God of the tribes of Israel and then uh, with this universal God, this God um, that we're understanding is the creator of all nations and the creator of everything, right? And so in those different portrayals are in tension in the Bible. So I want to go back to uh, Ira Glass and this uh, dividing line. So there has been this timeline then of all the people in Ira's family going up to him and him now, and he has put himself in a camp where he's been identifying here as a non-believer, and that separates him out from all the believers in the past. And that obvious dividing line um, uh, that is, what's, what's the difference? And I think for a lot of people um, who are sophisticated people, who have gone through graduate school and all this kind of thing that are in a place that listen to Ira's audience and everything like that, um, that there tends to be this sense that that dividing line is in fact one of intelligence. In other words, I'm so smart I know better than all of uh, those other people that went before me. Um, but what I want to point out here, so if we have that thing as a timeline, on the one hand, so we're here in the present, and this is all the people in the past, right? And so there's a bunch of people that are in that camp or that identified in the present. But of course, there's way more people in the present all around the world who are not um, being put into that camp. And I think that one of the things that one does when you separate yourselves off and say, I'm in this place 
uh, and I know better than all of uh, uh, everyone else but you, on the one hand, you are dividing yourselves off from and not uh, listening to or understanding the experience of everyone else. Uh, and this is, I think, one of the reasons why, unfortunately, um, there has been or been able to be this rise of populist reactions as um, there is a whole bunch of the population, the major vast majority of the population of the world, who feels alienated from people who are divided off from them, who they therefore refer to as elites or something like that. So cultural or intellectual elites, however you want to phrase it. And so in a lot of cases, political uh, demagogues are able to rally all of those people because of this alienation they feel. But I think another part of it is, and this was the timeline of history here, that almost everybody, you're also, uh, also dividing yourself off from all of history. And one of the things I do want to point out is that this dividing line is not one between intelligence and not intelligence, because whereas there were certainly very smart people who are non-believers like Nietzsche in the past, there were plenty of people who count as believers, like Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and Anselm and Aquinas and New Newton, Boethius, Einstein, Augustine, Kierkegaard, whatever. So in other words, it's not that the, you know, it's actually about uh, intelligence. There's something else going on here. So how, how can we understand it then? So what, what were all those past geniuses, if they count in the camp of believers, uh, um, how, are we can, how can we reconcile that with what Ira thinks of as a, a fairly superficial, um, let's say, very uh, uh, literalistic belief in what he might define as like the Santa Claus story, but meant to be real or something. And there's ancient wisdom in these commandments that we have, this commandment uh, to not make an idol, right? To not fix our position or our, our painting that one painting on the Sistine Chapel and say, that's exactly what God is, I know God, or I know God is, uh, let's say, a man, <laughs> or is a human like us who talks like us, or is a, uh, white, or wears Roman clothes for some reason, <laughs> has a beard and all these kind of things, or is, let's say, for example, male, or any other of those things. What the Bible is actually telling us in, in antiquity is, no, don't make those kind of idols. We are not to picture God, we're not to limit the truth of God, we're not to limit our conception of God. God isn't those things, uh, you know, because if we were to fixate on that and to say that, or God is beyond those things, let's say, inclusive of more than those things. So it is a very, I'm, I'm now I've, this is my, this is not a very uh, satisfying graphic because I have not pictured God. <laughs> so, so the universal God, the God um, uh, that all of those very smart people going all the way back to antiquity and indeed all the way back to the authors, the prophetic authors who are writing the Ten Commandments list, is an unpicturable universal God. And one of the things that we um, are able to do in loving God and learning about God is indeed exploring, contemplating, defining, uh, in a way that can never end. It, our, our finite capacity to do that, we will, would never be able to reach the limits of what that could be. We can use that then, as we are doing that, is also the same way that we are finding meaning and value in life, in community, and the universe. Um, this is a, we had a very strong sermon by Chuck a couple weeks ago about just this thing, um, that when we have, um, rejected the idea that there is uh, any kind of meaning or value and instead decide that everything is arbitrary or indeed that nothing has meaning. Um, this unfortunately is one of the consequences of deciding um, that, uh, anyway, deciding to reject meaning itself. Um, and then in aimlessness is almost, almost inevitably the result because anything that you decide you do is ultimately arbitrary by definition. You may well do very good things, uh, but good by what standard, right? That it's only good in, in by either your own standard because you already have def uh, said that there's no such thing as good. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So anyway, that's what I wanted to talk about today. Um, as I was thinking about um, the Ten Commandments, I was thinking about how much um, in, in their heart, this heart, uh, this idea of not picturing God, not limiting God to a statue of Zeus, uh, and not imagining that God just looks like Zeus, 
uh, or something like that and, and limiting ourselves to that. The fact that that already existed um, you know, 2,500 years ago, that uh, level of wisdom, I think is very valuable to us and we should re-inject that into our, uh, our, uh, our dialogue now that we're having with people so that very intelligent people uh, like Ira Glass <laughs> are are able to say, okay, well, I'm, I'm now starting to understand what you're meaning. We're not, that this word that you're using, God, isn't something that is a constant in, in the sense of that we can define it and limit it, but rather uh, this is something that has ever been uh, open to new exploration as we understand more the, lim uh, the unlimited nature of what God constitutes. Um, and so anyway, so that is um, encapsulated in those Ten Commandments, and, and in indeed, uh, in an ironic twist, um, the picture that we have from the Sistine Chapel uh, and also from the Simpsons, <laughs> and uh, when people started picturing God in those kind of ways, that really is derived from Zeus. Uh, and so it's because the Romans were already picturing that, the Romans became the, you know, became Christians, and later the artists went back and they used that, that image in order to do it. Well, okay, you know, so we need to get past that um, re re pagan portion of our uh, faith so that it doesn't limit us in this way. Do you have a question? Could you go back to that graphic that has the, that, that great divide? Yes. Between the, oh, yeah, or, or, or this one. So is, do you feel like this exact same thing that is happening right now, that we have this, uh, this kind of group of the I don't know, like the non-believers and uh, the, the people on the right side of the line who are still the believers, the little guys in, yeah. in yellow. Uh, is this something similar to what was happening at the time that all the, uh, the, the scripture has been written down? Is this like, um, so we know there's plenty of evidence that says that the ancient Israelite religion was pagan as yes. uh, like just like everyone else's and at this time period that we're just developing this strong monotheism yep. we're just having this debate no god is not a guy riding a chariot and just um right just doing the kind of things that god we used to think god does god doesn't have a wife called asherah right. god doesn't just do all these things because it's not a person is yep. this the same debate that we're having right now when we're trying to remind yeah. people, no, this is not what we're talking about when we say God? So it could be, but it, I think it isn't right now the same debate. And let me explain why. So I, I agree with you that when we're having this very important axial age moment of transition from uh, paganism, which is to say honoring all of the old gods in all of the different ways and maybe even thinking of them much more literalistically and instead now um, understanding a much um, more cosmic, a much uh, vaster and more sophisticated um, vision of God that that was happening. But I would say that what's, what the difference is is that um, in that, even in that major jump that's happening, there is no throwing away all of the heritage that went before it happening. So what instead, it, what instead happens is all of that stuff, those stories, all those understandings um, that are, are now, let's say, being um, superseded, that all gets brought along. So the heritage isn't rejected and thrown away and you're not cut off from it and say, oh, well, that's all, that's it, we've had a good, time with all of that, but rather um, all of those stories of Yahweh, who is just, the, just a regular little god and a pagan, those all, those all come, come through and indeed most of, the, most of the idea makes it across the divide, right? And so that's why I would say that that's a little different. Um, that could be exactly the same now if, um, if in coming to a new understanding um, in the secular world, uh, that, let's say, secular humanists or whatever emerged out of it, um, nevertheless still um, are not nihilists if they've decided, okay, well, there is some kind of inherent uh, meaning, there is, some things are, there is something that is, can be called good, uh, that it's not just simply nothingness, then they will have simply um, made a new word for God, but kept God even without, when they simply have gotten rid of the word. 
So in that sense, um, that would be the same because then it would have gone on. But if we actually are moving to, um, you know, if we are in a place where we're saying there's nothing is real and we really are embracing just total relativism, um, that there isn't any any particular good and value, and it's simply convention that we um, that we say or anything is good or not, um, then then I think that we have re that that is on the other side of the of a real ba boundary um, from uh, where we've been. And so what I think is that in this, this same little chart here is um, if we look at any of these guys, even including, let's say, Newton or Einstein or whatever, Newton actually had a fairly unsophisticated view of God. But anyway, Einstein has a fairly sophisticated uh, view of God. This is a, sometimes physicists aren't the best <laughs> in terms of understanding these kinds of um, what might be more like uh, humanist kind of uh, the humanities and that kind of questions, theology, philosophy, and things like that. Um, but there is, again, like I say, understanding here um, that all of these conceptions that we have shouldn't be literalistic, they shouldn't be limiting, and that indeed, I mean, we have a hymn, we limit not the truth of God, right? And so that reminds us this particular theology that in fact, um, if you ever get to a place where you think, okay, well, I've totally got it now, I understand the Trinity, <laughs> you know, or something like that, or I understand, um, you know, what is good and, and meaningful and I got a picture that's perfect of God, then you have to know that that's when you especially don't get it. <laughs> Uh, you know, that you have, there's something beyond that. It's the same thing that we learned when we just are committed to lifelong learning. Uh, we get to as old as we are and as much as we've learned, and you realize, I, I, there's so much more that I don't know than this, what I do know, even if I may know a whole bunch of stuff about ancient history or any other thing. I, I, there's way more that I don't know <laughs> than what I do, you know? So, yeah, Chuck, can we get the microphone for Chuck? If people like Ira Glass uh, moved to sort of a dogmatic decision that no, there is no God, or have they simply shifted and declined to accept contemporary or views of the past of what God was to something that's more inclusive? more universal? I think that they, they think, think that this nothing? is... think there's nothing? I think that, I think that both agnostics and atheists in general think that God is this guy, which is largely, you know, like literally as an analogy with a human being who's thinking human thoughts, speaking human words, doing human-like stuff, and then they don't believe that that being exists. But we also, as believers, I think most believers anyway, certainly in our tradition, our church, are also not picturing God as a guy like this who is simply doing human stuff who you can call on the phone or something like that. I mean, we, we talk about it all the time that we talk about um, God as love itself, for example. God, love for love's own sake. So if God is love, God is something more than a guy, right? Uh, we're not saying that God is simply love or God is simply wisdom, but in other words, that God is encompassing of all of those, uh, for example, uh, eternal concepts, right? Everything that is eternal indeed. Did you have a comment, Joyce? Or I'm sorry, you. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> and, God is a spirit. So go ahead and ask. <laughs> yeah, God is the spirit. We think about God is the spirit. So what's a spirit? Perhaps a feeling, an emotion, or... Yeah, so then in that sense, intelligence. yeah, intelligence, emotion. So, so in, I just was wondering, because sometimes in the modern times we tend to have, um, we're in this radical material time period when spirits, even ghosts or whatever, ghosts are like in Ghostbusters can be um, trapped inside nuclear <laughs> empowered <laughs> things, right? Because they have a physical presence and because, uh, because we understand now that energy is, is also matter, right? But, but in the traditional understanding is what you're talking about entirely, which is to say intelligence, um, um, not emotions, but the, but the actual, um, the love or whatever that you are experiencing, not your, not your physical component of it, but, the, but the, everything that is therefore immaterial. So that's traditionally how we understand spirit. So God is, is, spirit is another way of saying God is not matter, right? God is not material, but God is beyond the material, right? And so, yes, so exactly. That would be one way um, we understand it. How do I phrase this? I'm trying to find the best way to phrase and get a perspective on this. 
um, I understand the spiritual aspect of it and feelings, but when they say God, he made us in his image. Yes. Can you help clarify that? And yeah, so how do we understand that with, uh, um, if we're saying that, for example, um, if I'm trying to say this picture here, which looks like our image, <laughs> Um, that that this we that we shouldn't um, um, reflect ourselves back and try to create the li a limited view of God, and so um, historically there's been all kinds of different ways that uh, these different thinkers have tr have worked on how does image work in that way, um, and so one of those is uh, all the way back. So for example, Philo of Alexandria, it's a Greek uh, philosopher. I'm sorry, a Jewish philosopher in in Alexandria uh, of the first century, uh, writing in Greek. I was saying, we, when we read that passage, we, it, it's blasphemy if we think that that means that, um, that God is, is a human being that has a physical form, but rather um, he argues that what that means is um, God is reason itself and intellect itself and, in that in, and love and all of those other components and in that, um, uh, that image by making us as uh, cre the cre components of creation that are reasoning, that have uh, the capacity to think and all of these, all this kind of reflection, that that is when we are doing all those things that we are reflecting God, uh, and actually, indeed, maybe even having a, a divine spark within us, you know, as we are um, getting closer, closer to God. So I, that, I think that's how it would be. At least that's an argument that Philo made, and I think several other um, uh, Christian and Jewish philosophers too, theologians. We do have to close because we're going to have another, um, uh, we have our Logos meditation in 10 minutes. But I really appreciate all of the discussion that we've had here and I hope um, this was a sensible uh, <laughs> lecture. I, I did, I went, this took a different turn than it was going to because I was listening to this radio program <laughs> yesterday and I wanted to, I wanted to call him right then. But in any event, I've called you now, Ira, so you can write me back. <laughs> but thank you guys so much for, um, for being here. We'll, be right back in 10 minutes with Logos Meditation.